Welcome to the Peripheral Views Podcast. We are back again. Uh, new episode today. A little different, a uh, little different topic, different uh, format for today's episode. Uh, I'm your host, uh, I'm sorry, I'm your host, Jake. My co-host is Errol. Errol's with me tonight. What's going on, Errol? You know, just uh, enjoying the evening, uh, ready to uh, talk about an issue that I feel like is in a uh, isn't very much talked about. I wanted to, I wanted to name this episode uh, when I first started thinking about it. Uh, uh, a dr- or redressing the elephant in the room. Ooh, nice, nice. I see what you. I see what you're aiming at. Yeah, <laughs> and what that is is um, just uh, we're gonna just be talking about like uh, sexuality in general, and like well, kind of like hypersexuality in media. And um, just like uh, it throughout history and whatnot. Um, anything I missed, Jake? No, no. I think that's that's the target for the uh, for the episode. Uh, we're gonna kind of unpack the. Uh, I mean, it's it's tough to take on just you know the cultural sexualization aspect of of you know civilization across the globe, like in one <laughs> short podcast. So we're basically just gonna kind of synthesize. Um, just some thoughts we have on where cultural sexualization is at, its impact, what it's doing, you know, what it's doing to the youth now in the way that it's kind of presented in uh, culture and in uh, society. Um, so a little bit of a topical pod today. Um, and the difference is uh, the main, main difference format wise is that this is this episode is probably not it's not going to fall into any of the series. This is going to be just kind of a standalone. And I think. You know, we've talked about this a couple of times. We're probably going to do this from time time to time just to hit some topical issues, stuff we want to maybe we've been itching to talk about um, that's a little less restrained to the series uh, aspect of the podcast, but uh, nevertheless, valuable contributions of dialogue, hopefully, um, to certain topics. So we're uh, I'm looking forward to getting into it. Um, before we do that, Errol, we should probably know. Um, we were a little hesitant to, to comment um, immediately on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that has uh, deeply escalated, um, obviously, in the last 24 hours. Um, but being that, you know, it's, it's a topical episode for the podcast, we figured maybe, maybe we'll talk about it for just a, a few minutes just to mark that it is, uh, you know, it's October 8th, uh, 2023, when this went down. Um, things seem to be getting pretty hot in the desert, Errol, wouldn't you say? Yeah, um, and it's absolutely a shame because it's always been such a powder keg in itself with um, innocent people like falling in the mix of what's going on. Um, you had uh, yeah. uh, two, uh, two regimes that weren't willing to uh, really communicate, and uh, they were just uh, you know, both pretty much fighting tooth and nail. Um, until uh, the other day when it all kind of came to a head and they did a, uh, a Hamas launched a attack, which is a uh, terrorist group. It was uh, unilaterally condemned by the UN and the United States. Uh, to everyone. Um, the, the reason why that's bad is because uh, I know like some people might, if you're not like actually like following it, you like, well, didn't like um, Russia and Ukraine like do stuff like that. And it wasn't like, you know, the whole world didn't go up in arms. Um, they haven't been necessarily just indiscriminately targeting uh civilians yeah that's is is the difference major difference and like um i don't know i've heard a lot of arguments on both sides this is a very like long-standing historical oh yeah issue that's just i mean this 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 is this region has been plagued by violence and and war for i mean it's a history it's a story as old as, as time i mean it's it's just been going on for centuries um specifically though um it seems to me that you know israel is a as a you know as a acknowledged nation post-world war ii has been um 
I don't know. For my money, it's it sounds like there's been some militaristic. For what I can understand of the issue, which I, I would hesitate to um, present myself as any anything other than you know moderately in, engaged with it, and probably still pretty ignorant on the issue. But from my perspective, it seems as though that the nation of Israel has probably conducted some pretty horrific stuff uh, militaristically against the Palestinians in what is considered to be like holy sacred land um, to both faiths. Um, but the difference being is that it seems, it seems that like um, Hamas specifically is, you know, obviously conducting some pretty horrible crimes against civilians specifically, which is like, civilians. And, the, and it seems that this specific attack is like a little bit different than previous ones from what I can tell is that it's like the targets seem to be, seem to spe a, spe be specifically civilians and be like women and children and like the elderly, um, which is just God awful. And um, did you see that they came in on like paragliders? Yeah, like over a music festival, I think is like the one of the first. Uh, I, I yeah. think that was one of the first um, reports of of their attack was at a music festival, and I, from what I, it's hard. You're getting a lot of uh, because it's such a hot, hot radioactive issue. You're getting like a lot of reporting. It's hard to know what and and I would I would say that it's it, social media is like kind of. <laughs> we're going to talk a lot about social media in this podcast and. Uh, the, it, as a starting point here, it's tough to get your news from social media, but it's also tough to not. Um, and like, you're getting a lot of reporting of multiple stories. And I know that there was a music festival where things kind of get kicked off. Um, and there was a report, I also saw a report of like 260 concert goers were killed, um, which is, it's abhorrent because like, that's abhorrent because I mean, these people have nothing to do with anything. And, and, and it's also probably likely that they're not all Israeli Jews. Right. Um, you got to imagine that there's probably some like um, a immigrants or B tourists at a, you know, a music festival. Um, I mean, it's just, it is a horror show and um, it's hard not to. Um, it's hard not to ex expect a lot of like, disunity on the issue because it has always been so disunified and um you know I, I don't know we i think at the end of the day violence against civilians is like probably one of the things that i think that the world could probably rally around however i don't expect that um being that being being where it's taking place right like this this part of the middle east is just never gonna you're never gonna get um you're never gonna get like consensus among world leaders on, on anything that happens in this region. So right. it's, it's, it's bad. It's not a good, uh, it's not a good situation. And you actually said the, the term that I remembered. Um, and I uh, actually reiterated the same term to my, to my wife earlier today about it, uh, you know, talking about it and uh, powder keg really kind of suits it um, because it seems like that's what's going on and you worry where that goes. Um, because I guess there's been some like um, reports of like uh, anti-Semitic violence in Egypt. Um, oh, yeah. Trying to spread like, like powder keg is kind of a perfect word for this. Cause you want, you you worry how quick this spreads. You obviously already see in the United States. There's like a lot, there's not so much on like, there's not violence, but there's unrest. Um, which is, uh, which is always scary. You don't want things to go that direction. It's, it, it, things, things can stay peaceful um, for, for only, only for so long, but hopefully this is not like a tipping point where like, you know, you see global violence in support of um, one or the other. So mm -hmm. ugly stuff, ugly stuff. We are not going to get all too much brighter. <laughs> we are, we are cynics on this day, Errol. <laughs> you said, uh, you said something about a, uh... Uh, Dan Carlin had something to say about it. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I should, I should reiterate his tweet. Um, Dan Carlin um, of hardcore history. We are both, but I would say hazard to say, honestly, Earl, you, you could, uh, you can agree with me or not major influence on our podcast. Right. I mean, yeah, like pretty much, I was actually just telling my wife about, um, he actually did a podcast years ago where he was a guest. I can't remember who the host was, but um, he was a host uh, or uh, he was being hosted on a podcast doing an interview and he basically like inspired me so much uh he was saying something along the lines of like um just basically people like if you're doing a 
and he was trying to speak to anybody who's like entrepreneurial or who had like a, a vision or had a, uh, a business idea or had like a, you know, a passion project that they were like a little hesitant to tackle or go for because they thought that their ideas weren't good enough or, and he was just like, just do it and do it poorly. And uh, he was like, and he specifically said, like, if you want, if you've got a podcast idea or you've got a podcast you want to do, like, just do it cheap, do it is do it as often as you can get, get better at it, do it poorly at first and get better at it and it'll come. And, you know, I remember hearing that and thinking, yeah, I, I definitely, uh, I'm feeling what you're saying, what you're putting down. But as far as the Palestinian is, is really com- conflict. Um, he said, um, this was his tweet and I thought this was actually a good, a good, um, sentiment. He said, and you know, he falls on one side or the other and, and the, the side of, of which he falls on, it will be made clear by the statement, uh, quote, Palestinian leadership has once again made a decision that will in, in no way improve the lives of their people. There is no positive outcome for them here, except for personally, except to personally bolster their chances to stay in power. They have hurt their cause slash causes and increased the suffering in Gaza. Um, mm. And he actually continued, um, he continued on a thread on this, but I thought that was like being that he kind of like summed it up pretty well. And, and it's that statement on its own kind of comes across as being a little critical of Hamas, which um, for my money is warranted. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do understand. I understand that it's, it's complex. What's, you know, the situation is complex and the Israeli government is not like, its hands are not clean, but um, the innocent civilians and women and children who suffered today were certainly, you know, their hands were clean. And, um, you know, I, I just think it's, this is not a, this is not a productive means of, you know, uh, coexisting or, uh, you know, I, I don't know, two state solution aside, it seems like. You gotta, like, you I gotta don't. wonder what the end game is. Likewise. I, I think the same thing. Uh, it, it's curiosity at this point. Because it well, I mean, it was a religious holiday. I think Yom Kippur was on Friday, or uh, yeah, I think it was on Friday. So you wonder, I, being a religious holiday weekend, um, it's not surprising that this happened now. But you wonder what. Um, uh, it's it's tough, man. It's tough to be on Twitter right now. Twitter's the worst. Uh, I was just uh, you know, there's just a lot of horror, horrible um, video circulating in the social media sphere. Probably going to take a little rest from uh, Twitter after this podcast, though. Um, not to be, like, uninformed, but it's, it's tough to see some of the stuff. Tough stuff. Um, but anyway, um, let's introduce the podcast a little bit, Errol. Let's move on from the horror show that's going on in the Middle East, and let's talk a little bit about the podcast and what we're going to talk about today. Like Errol had mentioned off the top, um, we are talking about uh, the hypersexualization of the uh, not so much just the 21st century, but just Western culture in general. Um, really wanted to uh, take an opportunity to, to talk about that. But uh, if you just bear with me, we're going to pull up our little script doc here. Um, well, actually, we'll just go right off the top. Um, you know where to find us. We're at uh, we're on Twitter um, at peripheral V one, two, three. That's the Twitter handle. Um, throw us any feedback about the podcast. You can reach us at peripheral, peripheral views podcast at gmail.com. Um, we are also on SoundCloud. That is going to be soundcloud.com forward slash peripheral views one, two, three to check out any dropping content. You can stream us there. Um, anything we put out. We are on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Um, that's probably the most accessible accessible place that you're going to find our, our content. And if you do, please leave us a review rate rating and uh, please subscribe because that's super helpful for the pod and its growth. Um, and if uh, YouTube is your, uh, you know, platform of choice for this kind of content, we are also on YouTube. Just throw us in the search bar, peripheral views podcast, everything we've done other than I think one uh, episode is, should be up there. Um, I don't think the Lupe Fiasco, I forgot to put the Lupe Fiasco episode on YouTube. So that, that actually, that one's on me. Um, but if anybody's itching to hear it, I'll, I'll try to throw it up on there as well. Um, and all our content, as, uh, as we've mentioned in previous, previous episodes, 
shoot us uh you can reach all, all these platforms too um through our our website that's uh peripheralviewspodcast.com so uh now that we got that all out of the way errol what do you say we dive into the content of the day i'm ready okay um so we're talking uh sexualization cultural sexual sexualization um errol what do you think we, let's uh we're kind of we don't really have too much of a structure for the pod today so let's uh let's just dive right in um you want to start from like a historical perspective or uh, an evolutionary perspective errol to uh kind of kick things off um evolutionary might be like a good uh good start slash um like argument sure why don't you lay, lay lay out the groundwork for what does um what is sexualization in uh, in a culture and, or um biologically wh- where does this kind of land on the spectrum of like you know human significance and like where where are some of its origins um so to speak just in the culture so um i believe uh like the first advertisement um and that so uh the first advertisement that was on record somewhere around uh like 1871 but um people have been uh sexually exploited like since the dawn of time right um at least um especially depicted in media there's always like you know the fair maiden no even depicted in like writing and stuff there's always like you know the fair lady um it's always uh, a, I don't want to say like an impossible standard, but a standard that is not on the average. Um, the shifting goalposts too, right? Like, like these, uh, the standardization of of like or expectation of like women specifically in like a sexualized um, sense, in like where where they are, you know, um, how they're perceived culturally has always been shape shifting along, along the timeline of, of, you know, history, which is like, obviously very like not a, it's not helpful for women. And it's also probably very destructive for women um, largely. Oh yeah. And it's also going to um, shift like in like a cultural aspect, like a, uh, for example, um, what is or was attractive is not, um, how it is or how it was at the same time and like what's attractive over here is not going to be what's attractive what's like that's a what's over there um for example i believe like during like uh the edo period uh in in japan going back to uh you know the far east going back to the land of the rising sun because we can't escape it <laughs> um it was uh considered attractive to have uh black teeth oh wow because yeah. yeah you can see you can see where like um yeah, go ahead. I, I'll let it, you finish that point before I die. It, it meant you could have aff- you were rich that you could afford sugar and tea, just probably, like too, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just like in uh, uh, just like in England, if you were um, like you know, a little bit bigger of a lady, that was seen as attractive or like royalty because like you weren't a peasant, like you could afford to yeah. eat. So and like you lounged around, you were a lady of uh, nobility. Uh, right. So those... this this taps into the perfect. Uh, not, sorry, to, I don't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to like kind of put this in the box where it belongs quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, so like this is what we're talking about here is like the cultural aspect of sexualization. Whereas I think we also are going to kind of parallel that with like an evolutionary sense, like an evolutionary biological sense, um, in terms of like, and we'll we'll dive into that. I'll let you I'll let you keep the ball rolling. Um, but this would fall into like. I guess there's two camps you can really stick sexualization um, for for both men, male and females. Um, you know, you have your cultural sexualization, and then you also have like a biological or an evolutionary one. Um, I would say that what you're discussing there, and especially when it comes to like media, like that's purely cultural because we're like so defined by um, what uh, what media and marketing um, kind of it, it kind of shifts and shapes our. Uh, you know, our perspectives on society. Did I lose you? You still there? Yeah, no, I'm totally sorry. I, I did get sidetracked. Um, but on an evolutionary perspective, um, it's like arguably like uh, the driving force or at least uh, I can't think of it. Uh, uh, some uh, 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 some um some guy was talking about how it's like the only driving force. I, I think it's, uh, 
I think it's Freud. Freud said that like uh, sex is the driving force behind like everything. Like um, at the end of the day, like you want like a nice job, nice car, like, you know, nice house. So you can like attract women. Like the end game is just like procreating. Um, and so, yeah, no, I think you're well, Darwin was uh, Charles Darwin would have been like one of the founders of like the concept of like reproduction drives all like, Uh, Mm -hmm. not so much that like um sexualizing the culture is the most important thing like i think darwin was responsible for the theory of like which actually can go into a pretty deep and sick direction because i I believe that like i think i think actually hitler um followed this to like followed this thread all the way down um all the way down the rabbit hole of like sexual reproduction being like utmost of utmost importance um Mm -hmm which was a very Darwinistic perspective, um, but also obviously taken to an extreme degree. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, like evolutionarily speaking, if someone like, you know, if they had like perfect skin, a symmetrical face, uh, shiny hair, perky breasts, wide hips, wide hips for child. Yeah. They had childbearing hips, big breasts for like, you know, providing the milk, um, symmetrical yeah. face they didn't have any uh, gene issues and um right also like it just indicates that they are in good health so like if there is like a uh like a biological uh kind of uh like cog that like yeah that will push us towards like attractiveness or like you know objective attractiveness but the issue i find is when they start using those advertisements for like the first advertisement ever like a tobacco brand like what does a half naked mermaid lady have to do with like smoking a pack of cigarettes well what they found was that because so like i I, what i would assume is and this is not a this is not in defense of that this is almost like the opposite is that like it must have been at some point discovered um well you've obviously heard the term and most people have like sex sells right um which is a you know, in, in the world of advertisement and marketing is like fairly obvious, but you got to try to unpack that. You think about why that is. And it's like, it's one of the few, there are like a lot of, and you learn this a little bit. If you follow anything in like neuroscience about like, you know, like a dopaminergic response to things like reward systems in the brain, mm-hmm. and like sex and sexuality is one of the few things that like is so like, you know, sexual behavior, like orgasmic orgasms and things of this nature are specifically, I guess the orgasm itself, but, um, are like, they exist for like incentivization for reproduction, right? Like you want to incentivize, like if if that's the goal of the species is to reproduce, like the brain, you have to, the brain has to be incentivized to like repeat the behavior. Right. Um, right. So like, it's kind of non, like it's like one of the few dopamine centered behaviors that is like non-artificial right like there's no external there's not really an external um drive other than what's kind of already baked in evolutionarily and and biologically so like somebody in the world of like marketing or whatever it doesn't even have to necessarily be marketing it's kind of also I, you think a lot of this stuff is like mostly unconscious right like so people have been writing about like yeah there have been like there's been like erotic novels across time. Well, like think about uh like even like the depiction of uh like aphrodite right right yeah so that's that's a great example like uh we've always uh we've always held these uh these almost symbols of like womanhood to such a high standard that we like carve them in marble and um so from like an art perspective that's that's okay that's okay to do that but once you start you know putting that on a t-shirt or like even worse like using that to like you know i guess like a like just slap it on like you know a pack of cigarettes then like what's the point of that well that's 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 my, that's where it becomes exploitation right so like yes like i was saying like because we because it's so baked in it's almost just like you you see the behavior you see a man or a woman respond to something sexual in the culture or in society or in public or whatever and like anybody who's got something to sell and is and is thinking deeply about how to get it sold 
attach it to something that is ubiquitous among human beings and like sex sells is a exploitive term and it's an exploitive practice but it's it's really entrenched in like a it's entrenched in like an intrinsic truth about human beings you know it's not it is exploitive and i think it has led in my opinion it's led to to things that are that's like a it's like it's like a a, almost a a crossing of a line it's like a boundary line that should Mm -hmm. Should be enforced because all that's really happened from the sex sells marketing scheme of the last whatever how 100, 150 years whatever how long it's been um, probably longer um, from a historical context but like the downstream effects of that are probably more destructive than and if it's also probably fed the capitalistic machine that is running rampant, you know, not to, I'm not trying to make Marxist claims, but like capitalism needs places of. Well, that's, that's too. exactly, that's exactly my problem with it. And one of the reasons why I did want to uh, start uh, or uh, talk about this, because like I was saying, like when it comes to art or like an art form, that's okay because you're doing it for the sake of that. Right. But like once you switch over into like advertising and like just trying to like push like an an idea with um, pushing an idea with just like, you know, a naked body or a near naked body uh, for the sake of capitalism, you are exploiting both the, the people who are being used as models. And then you're exploiting the people who look at those advertisements in multiple ways. Um, It's a, the for the uh for the viewer uh depending on your age uh the younger you are you see that and then you're like okay that's an advertisement that is the societal norm you're like this is what is it is ups- expected of me um so that is something i should strive for or at least that's like uh, socially acceptable on a larger scheme um and so best case scenario you will like in in the eyes of a like the what the advertiser wants best case scenario you'll like want to buy that product and then you will try to like strive for that perfect ideal you know what i mean like the whole time and then i don't know maybe you get it and then you just keep promoting that brand or something but uh worst case scenario is um it's going to in either way i think both uh, a and b it's it's going to promote negative behavior uh you're going to you know can you give wonder, an example of like what what would you consider to be negative? I'm not I'm not disagreeing. I'm actually I'm just trying to I'm trying to push your idea a little bit further down the road. Like yeah. what would you consider to be those negative behaviors? Like objectification specifically? Well, so uh say if you are like a a young woman and then you see like a a bikini model and you're like, "Okay, I need to look like that for beach season because that is like what people are doing. That is the regular thing to do." Um those models are uh like at like uh i think like five percent of people on like or five percent of yeah five percent of people like on earth have those like model standards where it's just like the perfect proportion body um like some people are like legitimately just built different so if you are like you know a little bit overweight or a little bit underweight um it's going to promote eating disorders uh stuff like that uh, poor body image because like say you're even like if you're a developing child and then if you're a boy, you just see like, Oh, like just a Jack person. Like, All right. I got to do that. Um, so like, it's, you're going to have these uh, negative body images because like, you know, whether you're like not going through puberty or you're not like, you know, yoked at the age of like 14, which would be unhealthy actually. For sure. Um, to, you're to be, because you're in development. Yeah. You'll, you'll stun, uh, you'll stunt your muscle growth. Right. Um, or like if you're a girl who's like developing, you're like, oh, I need to, you know, not only be thin, but I need to like, you know, fill out everywhere. So if someone's not filling out, they're going to feel inadequate. Nothing they can do about that. Um, but, you know, now in media, uh, in the just a, a societal norms, like you can always just uh, correct that. You can. Well, I was you know, just get thinking some... as you were saying that, like, so you, you, it makes you wonder almost like, um and there's a lot to like, there's a lot to kind of address there. Like it makes you wonder if like, so like the impact that marketing, that marketing sex has had the sexual, the sexualization of our culture via the vehicle of marketing. Right. 
it makes you wonder like almost on a health perspective like if enough so like i was actually just reading an art- article about like objectification um i've got this is one of the few that i had pulled up um but it's like it, it kind of it kind of i don't i'm just going to kind of paraphrase it here i don't want to quote it because i don't have the author's um name quite right ready here but um it like kind of theorizes about like how biologically like as like so like you have like a social cultural um construction that is shaped by like how we view sex right and and how we're we're marketed sex and Mm -hmm. and like a sexualized culture has like we have all these different uh, shifting uh, standards for what women should look like in in some in a lesser case how men should look like right and like if some of those practices of like 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 you were just saying like eating disorders were like because you have like the uh, malnourished models who are uh, like the emaciated models of of Western civilization over you know that was kind of like a thing for probably thirty or forty years in the late twentieth century you'd say probably is that about right mm, yes. probably probably driving even further into like the twenty first century probably the first ten years or so and then things kind of started shifting in a different direction but like the ama- and it's still a thing that's I don't, I don't mean to discount it but like the emaciation of like models who are supposedly who have been like airbrushed uh you know for lack of a better word like you know proverbially air proverbially airbrushed to be perceived as and i mean this because like marketing isn't just that it's to make the model look we're just going to heighten all of her great features and look how thin she is and look how great she looks. It's also just like, there's like color schemes and lighting schemes and like, what are they doing? The example I think of that is like the Paris Hilton advertisement where she's like half naked eating like a, the Carl's Jr. advertisement. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. Like where she's like eating a cheeseburger on on the hood of a Corvette or whatever. Um, And she's like half nude. Like that's like, that that aspect is like it's not just that like they're shaping the culture and what the expectation for women is uh, with what the expectation f- expectations for women are but they're also like they're playing they're playing uh visual tricks to like further tap into that dopamine response for men and um another example that i was thinking about earlier that and um i don't mean to tangent off of your off of uh your line of dialogue here but like um I'm wondering how the, I guess my question would be this. How do you think the, what do you think the impact is on a health perspective, generally speaking? Like you, do, do you, do you, cause I thought about this a little bit. Like, would you theorize that there's been enough women who have been impacted by like the social, uh, the social, socio-cultural construct of sexualized and objectification of women? Enough women have been like impacted by that on a psychological. I, I don't think I don't think there's a single person, a single human being in like a modern society who hasn't been impacted. Do you there's think that two- it affects fertility rates? Like that period. I wonder if that period of like where women were like, uh, I shouldn't say women. I should say specifically like models in that industry, like where. The, the women who are being objectified voluntarily because you could you basically have to consider it it's mostly self objectification unless there's something criminal going on it's self objectification right mm-hmm. um, so that being the case like i wonder if like because like they shape the culture enough of what women should look like that like i wonder if like for like there's been like health ramifications to like women's reproductive health over the course of time from having to like from from women being like basically culturally traumatized by the expectation that they should be like underweight oh yeah because they're definitely it, um there definitely is health impacts from not being at a uh at like a oh, healthy really? uh, bmi yeah um, that's what i mean is like i wonder how how deep and this this is like so you know this you could we could use this podcast to do that kind of research and but i i mean i think more so i i like to i like to use the podcast as an opportunity to theorize ideas as they come to us and like that was the first thing that um i was thinking about when you when you made your uh line of dialogue there um like how how much in how wide is the is the net of impact right right um but yeah i was um the reason i would say that almost everyone has been impacted by it is uh i there's just if you watch something then you're going to be uh 
you're going to get some form of like a some form of trope uh it's going to be an idealization whether it's like a cartoon or like a tv show uh that person in media got cast for like a reason just because they were the you know perfect like fit for it right. um one of one of those five percent and uh and the reason i keep bringing up that term five percent because i feel like a big problem with um self images in general <clears throat> are portrayed by the media mm -hmm. and it's um it's part of the uh the swimmer's body illusion okay so uh, the swim swimmer's match? Yeah, the swimmer's body illusion is a cognitive bias where um, people confuse uh, selection factors with actual results. So okay. um, you have models selling rejuvenation cream. Mm -hmm. Like you have beautiful women who are like already perfect, who got screened like for uh, for like, you know, a high end uh Marketing like agency a beauty or company marketing agency that sells beauty products. Um, they are not selling the rejuvenation cream because they needed that rejuvenation cream and it worked perfect on them. They're selling it because they're beautiful. Like they right, are beautiful. That's why they're chosen. They were chosen. Right. Their beauty is not displaying the like effectiveness of the product. Yeah. So like uh, the reason they call it the swimmer's body illusion is because a lot of people, they'll be like, oh, my God, look at like Michael Phelps, like or look at any other swimmer. Like he's just jacked, has a perfect six pack. Like I don't want to be like muscular, like a bodybuilder. I just want to be in shape like a swimmer, like an Olympic swimmer. So I'll just I'll start swimming and then people start swimming. And turns out they like won't exactly look like that. You won't have that particular build. Um, Although there's a whole great for you. We should not oh my god! Yeah, I was I was thinking about swimming almost because of uh, the swimmers. Amazing. It's a it's a well. It's, I was thinking that like when uh, my wife and I not this is a massive tangent, but like when my wife and I are are planning a, to buy a house, another house here in the next year or so. Um, like, gotta have a pool, and like, definitely. About, well, I'm gonna swap out like, um, if I run five days a week, I'm swapping out like three of those runs for just like swim laps because it's it's just like right. so much better for like impact and it's and you use more muscles so yeah i almost thought about swimming but it was a little bit due to that bias i was like oh i'll get in shape but the thing is if you are an olympic swimmer or like an accomplished swimmer you've you one have the build like you are going to be long and lengthy which mm -hmm. is like an attractive feature and two you've been swimming your whole life like you have like a strict diet um you train every day that is why you look like that like a yeah, person training who, is not michael phelps doesn't look like michael phelps because he's been in the pool only like he's right there's other he like, was born like that. that well yeah but yeah. He, he, he's not jacked because like he's just he, he those muscles and the way he looks and his build is like is it's an ex it you're, you're right he has like a genetic advantage because he he has like uh he has like a long upper torso and like long legs and like he has like those specific attributes that are like they're optimal for for uh, Olympic swimmer. But like the build itself is th there's other exercises. There's no way that his training regimen is restricted only to swimming. I mean, no, no, that's most that will exactly up. that too. Like it, it like 100 percent like you're going to do a bunch of stuff out of the pool. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yes. like um and like it's the same thing with like people in media like uh like oh that person's attractive because like they're wearing this style or they use this hair product like no they're attractive because they're attractive and then that is why they got the modeling uh contract or that per like is like you know a guy he's just really jacked and he's like oh i've been using weight burner like fat burners like just yeah, use oh, this yeah. and then like you've not, he's never touched that in his life <laughs> like, well the whole point of advertising is like that's what's so funny yeah because like the whole point of advertising is like um let me show you how easy it is to look as great as me like look how easy this is and look at how quick it takes like i just did six sit-ups with this like um, ab roller this both yeah this ab roller or this like bow flex piece of machinery i did it six times all you gotta do is this look watch now do this every day these this the six reps i did in this commercial because it's just it's i've i've found it interesting too because I, I want to bring this to you because i want to hear what you have if you if maybe this is just a me thing or maybe you can shed some light on it so like i was just saying this to my wife um just the other day because like commercials are always coming on and i've noticed that like recently 
I'm like judging product. I'm judging products lesser and lesser as, as like marketing kind of evolves. Like, I don't, I, I don't know how effective it is anymore. Cause I almost think like all of the advertisements I see now, except for like the classics, like bounty has had the same commercial over and over again for like 25 years, like <laughs> maybe even longer. Like it's the same, like find a creative way for somebody to spill something and then dive on the, on the countertop with a, with a, a bounty cloth to clean it up like magically. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like the same advertisement over and over, but like, I'm noticing that with, with some of the other advertisements that they're basically like, every day is like a is like a short film festival or like a competition i find it that it's it's like the creative the creativeness around the creativity i should say around like advertisement is like it's how creative and entertaining the commercial can be but would it's less important to display the effectiveness of the product yes and, um i, I find well, it like look at look at the though. look at look at the super bowl Oh yeah, it's all they're all little comedy shorts, mm-hmm. and like, but that's not. Is it actually helping sell? Like, is it, I mean, they they have data on this, of course. Like, there's enough data to go around. Everybody's tracking data now. I'm I'm a student in this field, so like, I know I know a little bit of how this like how important this is to to corporation, um, specifically corporate America. But like, you know, I'm sure there are data models that would suggest that this is like an effective form of marketing we see every every time we drop a commercial our uh, you know our purchase sales go up within for 24 hours x amount whatever whatever the models are using to scale things but for me personally is like i feel like maybe i'm a little more conscious to this stuff um than the average like viewer but for me it's just like if i find it less i find it less incentivizing to the product i don't really care about the product i care about the product a lot less when you're just showing me uh, you know this silly character that had a couple of, you know, a couple of, you know, one-liners that made me laugh. I don't even remember half the time. I don't even remember what the, what, you know, what, pro- what's the product? What was the company? Uh, there's a, there's a reason for that. And um, it's uh products more often than not are not to attract new people, but it's for the uh, users already. Ah, consumer retention. Okay. Yes. So, like, that's that. why all the truck commercials are really cool. That's why they're all like rock. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's also the same commercial. <laughs> like, like, unbelievable. It's amazing that like they've gotten away with that. Like, I've never had to renew a truck commercial in thirty years. They've oh, and by the way, all of those truck commercials take place. It's amazing. Like, I don't know how they do it. They advertise this truck for people who live in fucking on the east coast and somehow they've never done a commercial for the east coast it's always in like wyoming Mm -hmm. (laughs) like they're in the fucking rocky mountains just like cruising up the side of a mountain just off-roading and that's that and most of the truck sales are probably on coastal cities and for for people who never use them in this manner who are probably part that, that truck probably spends more time in a driveway than it does on a dirt road um it's just it's just a complicated um, it's a complicated world that is of marketing. Uh, my brother's in marketing, so I should ask him about it. But I don't know. I just uh, we'll we'll get back to like the sexualization aspect of it. But I I did want to just like touch on where uh, advertisements are kind of at in this in this era. Hmm. Um. But yeah. Some uh some more negative uh, effects of that. So ever since you're seeing like a, a top percentile of like the hottest people um, every time in all the media and they were good enough to be chosen for it. A lot of people will feel inaccurate or feel inadequate uh, that they are not able to achieve that. Uh, right. Of uh, self-esteem project uh, did uh, did a survey and they uh, concluded or they found that only 11% of girls worldwide would call themselves beautiful. That's terrible. Yeah. And uh, six in 10 girls avoid participating in life activities uh, because of concerns about the way they look. Um, One third of all six year olds in Japan experience low body confidence. Uh, Australian girls list body image as uh, one of their top three worries in life. Um, and 81% of 10-year-old girls in the U.S. say they are f- afraid of being fat. Awful. Jesus, man. I mean, it's it's just terrible. And 
I mean, thank you for sharing that, those statistics. That's, that's like really, that's a perfect, perfect uh, tool to shift the conversation into this, this direction of like, um, you've got to imagine, Errol, you tell me if you disagree, but like, you've got to imagine that a lot of those statistics are driven by the use of social media now, right? Yes. Um, it's only uh, fueling the flames because um, now instead of seeing that stuff on advertisements, it's a, uh, it's a game of popularity. You're seeing peers uh, who are attractive or like, you know, a certain kind of way and uh, they are generating a kind of, uh, you know, following behind that and then people will want to emulate that. And then that's there's a lot of stuff pushed on TikTok. You'll see all these influencers all the time. Be like, oh, buy my product. It's like it's almost like the say they're not like necessarily like sexualizing themselves at that point. They're just like kind of just well, selling it's themselves. It's a self objectification, but it's it's, it's almost yeah. not because it. See, this is this is where I actually come in a crossroads. So this is where kind of things kind of shift. So like the objective, the self objectification objectification we were talking about earlier is like found so much more in like adult advertisement. But when it comes to social media there actually is a social currency being pursued, right? Like, mm -hmm. I don't think it's the same. It's not quite the same thing as objectification or self-objectification. While it is, there is like an incentive. There's like a reward to the the action. And um, we should say, um, I know you said there's statistics and I'll pull some up um, while, we're, while we're kind of chatting here. Um, mm -hmm. but there's, there's like, most of the statistics are shown and I will cite, um, I don't have it in, I had it nearby, but I don't have it now. There is a, a great book on this, um, that, uh, I've, I've read through a couple of times for various different reasons. Uh, a couple of educational project projects I worked on, uh, it's called the coddling of the American mind by Jonathan Haidt and Greg, Gregory Lukanoff. Um, a couple of social science scientists, um, I believe one out of, shoot, uh, Jonathan Haidt is out of NYU, I think. I'm sorry, uh, his background I'm a little bit foggy on. But basically, he cites statistics as like um, girls are, are multi multitudes more likely to suffer from psychological um, damage from social media use or over social media use. Um and like this is part of it. Like by the way, they're they're basically airbrushing their own, you know, L'Oreal commercials on TikTok, right? Like that's what's going on. Because uh -huh. oh, you yeah. use filters to alter. I'm sorry, he's out of NYU. That's what he's he's from. His education was from Penn and Yale, um, but he's he works out of NYU. Jonathan Haidt book is called Coddling of the American Mind. There's a ton of statistical data in that book that talks specifically about the effect of social media. It's a really good source. Um, for this topic, but um, circling back, yeah, I think Errol, you, you hit those statistics are super important in how social media is just a. Um, I have two young daughters. I'll be honest, and you know, when they're of age, who knows what the world of social media will look like in ten or twelve years? But for for my money, it's it's like going to be completely outlawed uh, for them. Um, it's not a it's not a bad move. Yeah, um, I mean, until until I, I would say eighteen or something like that, when I I don't really have control. I mean, I'm not going to be a controlling parent, but like, there are certain things that I I, I perceive it as dangerous. Like it, to me, yes. it's dangerous. Um, oh yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of predatory people um on the uh, on the internet, and then you have the allure of trying to be famous, and then just people lying. Like a lot of bad stuff can happen. Um, also, it's, it's also just a, the culture that the culture that surrounds it. Like it's very like vain, right? It's it's so centered. Oh, yeah, no, on, for for sure. Like the objectification aspect is, is definitely real, but then the other aspect of like um, this, the, you know, you're getting quote unquote attention for your appearance on a platform. Um, but it's not, it's not real attention, right? Like you're getting, you're getting the, you're getting the stats, but you're not getting the, like the biological thing. Like somebody comments on, on your beauty and like the words might feel nice because they're right there in front of you. Like, so, it's a, um, it's a quick dopamine rush. And then it get, it can get to a point where that will replace actual like contact. Like, you know, well, look at it this way. L look at it from this perspective. So let's say you're a 14 year old girl or a 15 year old girl and you're posting on social media, you're posting on social media. Let's just say we lived in a world that you, you're, you're, there is no social media. And what would it look like? If another, if a year, so let's say you're 15 and a 20 year old boy comments on your, first of all, like, right. That, that's, 
we're, we're crossing into like taboo, right? But let, let's, all right, let's actually make them the same age just for the sake of the, the analogy. Let's say you're a 15 year old girl and you're in class, you're in school, you're walking around the high school hallways and a boy walks up to you and tells you how like beautiful you look or like, you know, or like gives you a, gives you a smile and a wink to indicate a thumbs up to match the icon <laughs> like <laughs> that. He like thinks you're attractive, right? And like that feels good because in the moment, like you're getting attention for looking or some or something, somebody there's nothing wrong with that, right? There's, like there's nothing that's it's basically harmless. But what would look weird is if you saw that same boy basically walking around the hallways saying it to every single girl, you know, like 18 of the 23 girls in the hallway at that time, he has done the exact same thing to, right? Um, it's then it's like toxic, right? That's that's hurtful. That becomes like a hurtful thing. Well, also um, at that, like um, that's just like an over uh, over media saturation. And it's um, kind of uh, you can go back to the uh, evolutionary theory there. So sure. you get this idea in your head that like, oh, if you are like, you know, a masculine guy, I'm supposed to procreate as much as I can with as much different people. Um, that is the portrayal that you see in media to you know the james bonds the cool guys they just you know do whatever they want sure. um and then also you've seen this like shift like uh with like you know like the into this hyper masculinity with like the uh uh like the andrew tates and uh like um like the people like that where they're like oh i'm a og i'm a boss because i have a lot of money because i'm in shape um and that's why I also have all these women. Like that's just not the case. Like it's another, uh, it's another um, this the swimmer thing. Uh, yeah, it's a facade, right? Like the whole thing. Yeah, the it, whole, he's not, not to say that Andrew Tate is a facade, but like I don't really know anything about Andrew Tate. I've actually never heard him speak, but like I've only heard other people speak of him. But like from my perspective, like from what I can see, it seems like um it seems like a dog and pony show like so it, it's exactly that what it is it's a um it's a pyramid scheme yeah for sure right. it's like a uh it's the uh male equivalent of a like you know how like the girls like the sensei he's like oh if you pay for this uh subscription i'll teach you how to be a boss and like little did they know like um he was like a like a professional kickboxer and like i believe his like a he was like relatively like wealthy or at least had like enough money to like, you know, go around from like Romania and stuff. Like he was already well, making about Andrew Tate. I don't, we don't need to give that dude any clout, but um, right. from my perspective, it's like the missing component, just circling back to the actual theory. Like you were saying that um, you were specifically saying that like uh, the, there was, there's a theory that's been perpetuated in media about like, um, reproduce with as men should reproduce with as many women right. as possible so, because that's a biological drive and like right that is a mis that's a misconception why don't you unpack that a little bit right so uh that's uh that's not what's being sold though by um by all those uh cool guys so you have a whole generation of uh of young impressionable kids who are like okay i need to do this if i want to be a man like this is what a man does now he has a lot of money and he's is successful like that is what i need to do um i i don't believe that that's healthy uh reason for that is is um I believe the best thing that you can do is uh like ideally is find someone who you are like attracted to like around your age so you can grow together raise a child and then be invested in the uh, community and um what singing music to my ears Errol. right so like what the media is pushing it's like a you know if you are like successful and whatnot like you can be an old guy then you can have a relationship with like a younger person um or like you know you can just uh, have all these uh all this stuff going on if you're if you're invested in all that one you're not going to be um as invested in like the child's life to gr grow them into a responsible adult like if you are you know 50 60 years old and then you have a kid with someone who's like 20 because they're attractive cool good for you but then by the time that gets 20 you're like out of the picture or like you know even worse like younger 
Yeah, um, I think. Well, let me let me jump in a little bit here because I want to I want to introduce like I want to actually um, I don't want to I want to categorize to some degree uh, what you're talking about and it's it's really just meaning right it's like that it's purpose and meaning and right. there's, a, there's a drive so like I think it's damaging so what the example you actually gave I'll, I'll, I'll touch that quickly like I actually personally know of an, a, a circumstance of which a, a forty a mid forties guy starts dating a girl in her early twenties. They, this was 10 years ago or so, or, lo- or maybe longer now, 15 years ago, the girls in her early to mid thirties, probably mid thirties now, um, actually maybe even late thirties. And the, and the guy is in his late sixties. So there's like a 30 year gap or so, something like that close. Um, and uh, they have a child together and they're like very like happy and like seemingly like, I mean, he's old, but like, you know, th- there are exceptions is my point, like for everything. So this is not, this is a general rule of thumb, but I love your rule of thumb. And I really think it's on, on the money because I do think that like purpose is derived from. So like, I, I just don't think you can derive happiness from simply just like trying to, I mean, how many people do you know? Like just, just do it anecdotally. Like anyone listening, you, you can, you can reach out to any anecdote you've in your world and find me one person who's who's single in their forties and still doing playing that kind of game of like, um, you know, how many sexual partners can you can you acquire? Um, how much money can you acquire? How much power can you acquire? How many things can you own? Like, this is a materialistic way to go through the world, um, and it's it is really it's super vain in in the first place, but it's also and it, uh, it's vapid. It's really, really it's it, dr- it drives itself though. It's a self fueling machine because so. it's pure dopamine. It's nothing. It's right. no deeper. It's not surface meaning. It's not or it is surface meaning. It doesn't go. Yeah. It doesn't dig down into like like I always say that. Well, let me introduce this because I've always wanted to bring this up in the podcast, and I always it, because I think it's a unique idea that, and it's not it's not a unique idea. I'm not going to claim that it actually is, but I've always felt that it is because I never heard anyone explain it this way before but i've been like kind of trying to like i have like this new mantra that i've been introducing um to like a little bit to my wife and and a little bit mostly to myself because i try to i think it's a it's like a really good um touchstone to reach out for every now and again and it's called the deathbed perspective i call it um and it's like trying to remember like if when you reach that old you know hopefully anyone listening and Errol and I are hopefully we're all lucky enough to like reach old age, right? You want to die of old age. Hopefully you live long enough to reach that point where you're, you're just old. When you look back, like that stuff, you will not think about that, that stuff. That stuff's not going to be what you're, it's going to, your, your family, like having family and maybe I'm not saying everyone has to have kids. I know that like, that's like a thing now people are not, they're kind of opposed to being family people, but like, the sexualization of culture is like a, it perpetuates this a lack of thinking about that. It's so impulsive, right? It's like this impulsive, um, you know, uh, what's the, it's like a gut decision about, you, people are making more and more gut decisions about what makes them happy. It's very like self-centered in a lot of ways. Um, but what you were saying about like, having a a spouse somewhere in your age and like deriving meaning from a relationship, a romantic relationship, and then like a familial relationship, hopefully with children is like, yeah. And that, that too, um, it's a, that, that's actually a really good point. Um, there is nothing wrong with, um, with not having children. Um, I was just saying like, uh, as opposed to like having like the age gap, like it'd be better, like two people who of the same age, but, um, still like involvement in the community like that is uh you know as long as like you're a positive influence um it doesn't matter like you know children no children as long as you uh, can bring something to where you're living you don't you don't need to just don't take anything away don't like be right. a, and to harken back to i just wanted to like connect that to what i was saying like a, a deathbed perspective would be like you know how many people like when you're on your when you're in those <laughs> when you're in those final moments like you're not really thinking about first of all you're definitely not thinking about your money and you're definitely not thinking about what you own unless unless of course those things are like going to your children like and then you might be so like the point being is that like you're externally focused at at the end of your life meaning i think that's probably a signal in my mind of what's most important while you're alive is like to externally focus and it's actually been a it's a my wife was just telling me that it's like it's actually a really healthy um psychological practice to alleviate um anxiety 
um, to externalize what you're thinking about to like, okay, like I'm, I'm, when you're feeling anxious, likely you're probably just thinking way too much and you're overthinking or you're thinking about yourself too much and to just displace that energy and that focus onto something on someone else. And it, mm-hmm. it actually has been shown to like really be act as almost a, an anxiety medication. Um, just as I like, actually read that. Yeah. So, um, cause, uh, contrary to popular belief, people be like, Oh, like don't repress that. Like, cause you're just going to, um, like subconsciously like dwell on it and it'll become a bigger issue. But yeah, it's a, uh, um, I forgot the study I was reading, but they showed like a bunch of people from different countries, like different, uh, coping, uh, like a coping mechanism on how to just like ignore like a problem if you had anxiety and, uh, the people who were actively like ignoring the stuff that would normally bother them, uh, were on average happier than the people who were worrying about it. So it is actually good to not worry about stuff. Um, at yeah, least well, not needlessly. Can I, can I drop like a quick anecdote that I, I know I'm being I'm being very anecdotal in this conversation, uh, probably more so than I, I would want to be. But and we'll get back to the st- you know statistics and data and information. But like just as a side note, that just to reach out on that is like we just took uh, we just took my uh, three year old to a trail like a spooky like haunted trail thing for Halloween, mm-hmm. um, and we're walking and my wife's walking with her ahead of me and my one year old, and. Uh, She's like, the three-year-old's freaking out. Like, she's just not having it. She's like, nope, nope, too scary. I don't want to go. I don't want to go flipping out, flipping out with my wife. And then I walk up and my wife's looking at me like, geez, like, what are we going to do? I guess we're not going to go. And um, we, she's like, well, why don't we switch? And then, so she takes the one-year-old and I grab the three-year-old by the hand. And I'm just like, okay, let's go. And like, she looks up at me and she's like kind of freaking out. And like, I'm like, no, it's fine. We're just going to go. Like, I just pretended like the freak out didn't happen and like <laughs> kind of forced her through it. And like all we, and we didn't, she couldn't even get to the beginning. So like, we're just at the entry point. And because there was like a lady in a witch outfit. So she didn't want to mess yeah, up. And we just walked spooky. Right. As soon as she got closer though, it became, we were, we were talking about this. Like it's not, it became not the unknown. So I just like, and my wife was just like, how did you get her to do that? Like, cause it, she didn't freak out again. We just, I grabbed her by the hand. We just walked. I was like, no, it's fine. We're good. And I was calm yeah. and like, just showed her that like, I'm not, I'm not worried about it. I'm not even like, do I even look remotely worried? Like, this isn't like, you don't have to be scared. Mm-hmm. You were saying like, re- you reminded me of this because like repressed emotion is, can be like damaging. And I know we, you know, psychologists talk a lot about that, but sometimes your emotions are irrational. And like identifying irrational emotions and absolving yourself from them through like whatever that means necessary in the moment is like, is like, that's gotta be part of the process too, because like, no, you know, feelings are complex and like, this just totally happened to my three-year-old in this like very unadulterated way where it was just like, she was scared. She was scared. She was scared because she didn't know what it was. And Mm -hmm. it was an irrational fear. It was probably sort of rational because like, you know, it's rooted in that she thinks that something's bad is going to happen. But like once, once, ra- once a rational scenario, you know, presented itself, it like absolved the fear, and now she felt way better. She had way more fun because that happened too. I bet. Um, mm-hmm. She like overcame. She was like, "Oh yeah, I'm good. No, I'm not. I'm actually not. I don't need to be afraid." Um, so like, I don't know. There's, there's like a, it's a twofold thing. It's just like repressed emotion is like terrible, and it's probably killed like thousands of men in their forties from like not addressing how they feel about shit. But like. It's also important to remember that like sometimes you feel sometimes you can't always trust exactly how you feel about things. Um, mm-hmm. So um I just think it's better not to like worry about like the future. Yeah, I mean it's not about it's not necessary to worry about it. Um, but that's where like planning helps. Like, I don't know, I'm right. Like put a plan together and but don't be married to it because things are not gonna happen the way you, it's almost like if you if you think about if you plan for like the things you're worried about and you just plan for them, it like lifts the, it like lifts the weight. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm worried that like, I'm, you know, this is going to happen if I don't do this. Well then build a plan around if that expect that to happen and build the plan around it. And then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, if it happens, I already have, I've got a safety net in my expectations here, you know? Um, But no, I'm with you. Like, Worrying unnecessarily is like a, it's a, it can be very debilitating for sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. So um, on that note, uh, just another, another tangent, so to speak, sort of, um, 
let's move into like the psychological impact. Um, we were talking a little bit about that, but I want to, I want to circle us back into that, um, into that, into that picture a little bit. Um, Errol, what do you think is the, uh, let's move it away from like kids. Cause I think that's where we kind of left off. Um, mm-hmm. Let's talk. Well, let's do this. Let's take a short break. And then when we get back, let's talk a little bit about like the psychological impact on adults and young adults um, in like the dating scene and dating spectrum um, as they kind of deal with a more sexualized culture. So let's take a short break. We'll be right back and we'll talk about that. When we get back. We are back. Um, we're talking the uh, we're talking about a lot of things, but the uh, main topic of issue is the uh, cultural sexualization. Um, typically, mostly we're talking about advertisements, marketing, uh, social media, um, media at large, largely uh, for the most part. So um, where we kind of left off, and we were going to dive into, we've talked a lot about um, the impact psychologically, culturally, socially. Um, that like an over sexualized culture has um, produced. Um, a lot of that was focused. We were, t- we were actually just wrapping up talking about like um, how that's impacted kids, um, you know, high schoolers and such. I thought I'd said a couple of statistics um, that I came across um, in terms of like sexual um, behaviors, just to kind of broaden the landscape. So like where things are at in that, in that field. So like, um, according to the CDC, this is the stat I just pulled. Um, 30% um, of high schoolers have, have had sexual intercourse, 48% do not use protection, and um, 8%, well, this is the horrifying one, 8% have been physically forced to have sexual intercourse when they did not want to. So these are like at risk, severe statistics that are pretty horrifying. Um, and um, largely, I actually am, would be, wouldn't be surprised. And that's another point that we could actually dive into. And this will kind of tie us into like the young adult aspect of things. Errol, what's your take on like, what, what role does pornography um, play in this, in this topic and like how, so we're, how we're I, approaching. You? So I think it's, it's just, it's the only uh, next logical escalation. Um, when you are 
subjected to all this stuff your whole life like you know um borderline nude people like sh- selling you like video games and like cereal uh you're like well what is you know what's the allure to that you can only be curious for so long before you start um you know stop settling for the uh for the sears magazine if you know what i'm saying right yep Right, I do. the old uh, what is it? Good, uh, good housekeeping. Good housekeeping. Yeah, you got like a lot of uh, yeah. yeah I see. I, I'm not. Even, I won't even crack a joke here. Um, right. But uh, no, I well, what's what do you think it's doing though? Like, what do you think that? Because it's very obvious that it's like, I mean, the statistics I'm getting are like somewhere in the order of like over half of the teens in the U.S. or like fifty. I'm what I have. 54% is the number I'm coming to. This is from the Hill. Uh, 54% of teens have reported having seen first online pornography before the age of 13. Um, yeah. And that's the thing. Everyone is, it's so, everyone's so susceptible to it now. Like uh, it's just kids there. are being, it's yeah, exactly. There. It's, it's, and this you is, can find it. You could find it on accident if you clicked enough links. So what do you think um, that's doing though? Like my question is like, what, do, what so is that doing? It to, is, it's, to, um, it is uh, it's creating an an un uh, it's creating an unhealthy uh ideal of sexuality if you ask me Agreed. um so uh to keep going with some of those statistics um a study uh examined sexting habits of uh, teens and found between 10 and 25% have sent texts so about a quarter on the uh, large end one in four and uh even worse, uh, fifteen to thirty-five have received it. So unsolicited mm. on the prefer those numbers to be matching. Or at least, you know, I'd like right. I would like it to be uh, you know, a little fifty fifty. Which um, by the way but, is like sexual in a lot of ways, it's like I mean it's it's just the thing it, so like my wife's a teacher and I once again I'm gonna be anecdotal, but like this is, she's had to express this to like her kids before because this has been an issue in, in public schools um, of like teens sending nude photos of one another to each other. And it's like, you do, you got your kids need to, and she's tried to explain this. Like you do understand that you're in possession of child pornography. When it's that, a, yeah, it's a felony. It's a, it's, it's a serious thing you're doing. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, I, personally, I think that like the sexting problem is tied directly to pornography because like it, guess what? It's all happening on the same devices. Like kids are not like kids aren't at home, you know, turning on their desktop. I mean, they are, but like, that's not predominantly what's going on. Kids are watching pornography on their phones because they have cell phones. Um, and guess well, what? By, by the way, they're also watching pornography on the same devices that they're utilizing their social media on. So right. Like, exactly. So um, it's all in the same space. What's the problem? The, uh, the statistics uh, from the, uh, what is it? The twenty-five percent to thirty-five percent. The that a ten percent different, or sorry, five to ten percent difference in the uh, received to, uh, or sorry, text to receive. Um, you're asking like, what is like the problem with it? I feel like um, a lot of these influences that you are bombarded with from childhood all the way up, all these like subconscious like images of like you know sexuality and whatnot. Right. Um, it, if it if it keeps building up, it leads to. Um, to sexual disorders it leads to uh paraphilias which are um they are pretty much just uh hold on they're like uh it's a uh, disorder or recurrent intense uh sexual arousing fantasies or urges uh behaviors that are uh, distressing or disabling um that include or but aren't limited to inanimate objects children non-consenting adults suffering or humiliation of a person or a partner um with the potential to cause harm so these um like the sexual extremes like the sadomasochist uh bdsm and that's not to knock anything on the bdsm community because um with a consenting partner that is like you know in, in a safe environment that's you know you could do whatever you want it's uh it's, a, it's. I don't think it's. I still. I still don't agree with it. But, two, but if two people are consenting, like far right, away, exactly. Like but, I'll, judge, um, I'll judge the behavior, but I won't judge you as a person because that's w- what you're into. Well, um, but that's the the I main thing. I can't not, imagine that it's psychologically like healthy. It's probably the main. The main thing there is the non-consenting adults. Um, right. if there's ever like a like a situation depicting someone like against their will, tied up or whatever, then that is a. Uh, 
it is a it's an extreme fetish it's a paraphilia and that actually does it leads to um bigger sexual problems um uh that are uh you know they they will totally uh like ruin your idea of like a healthy sexual relationship um, so that that's actually yeah i think that applies typically to like the young adults who are who are over utilizing um i mean it, it it certainly is impactful but le- on everyone who um overuses pornography and um you know i don't think that there's limitations on that but i will say that there are specific harms to teens that i think are important to touch upon um number one um i've got like a list of four here from uh, webgroup.com um this is the statistics drawn from a study um that they uh they conducted um through as a news media organization and um the four that they mention are increased odds of teenage pregnancy which you would imagine is probably just directly linked to like over sexualized young people who are having unprotected sex more and more because this is what they're um this is what's it, they're trying too, to keep so up with the, uh, they're it's occupying more of their mental space right like, yeah they're trying to keep up with the social status quo exactly um it hinders sexual development um which you got to imagine is the reason being for that according to this is saying pornography viewing by teens disorients them during the developmental phase when they have to learn how to handle their sexuality and when they are most vulnerable to uncertainty about their sexual beliefs and moral values um which i I don't know i'd like to read more about the science surrounding that um i could imagine maybe not a physical sexual development unless like it's saying that like um, you know, over, over ejaculation can produce like, um, I don't know, like impotence earlier in life or something like that. Like if you showed me science, I'd believe I could buy into some data if there was, um, any out there that would suggest such, or if, if that was evidentiary, evidentiarily backed up. Um, but my perspective is simply what you said, which is that like, um, the sexual development on a, on a psychological level in terms of expectations of the opposite sex and how a sexual relationship is supposed to look is probably what's being um, impacted most in terms of sexual development. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and the next one being it raises risk of depression. Um, yes. That one's definite. That one's definite. And it doesn't, it's, I don't even, it's, I think the pornography matched with the social media is probably what's doing that. Um, because, um, and, and that's what the kind of the, I don't want to speak for you, Errol, but that's like kind of the point of the podcast today, tonight is to, is to target something that I think is truly damaging. And that like, um, I do think the culture itself, aside from advertisement, aside from, you know, not even including this, just generally speaking, the culture itself has done a pretty poor job of like, um, limiting, of just you know having a more realistic understanding of and this obsession with sex is um it's a very um i I don't know i don't know exactly how to articulate it it's there's just so much more in life to to appreciate alongside sex it makes makes sexuality so much more um appealing and, and interesting and fascinating as a part of the human experience but because anything that's obsessed over or just over um focused on it it just diminishes its value um i'll hit the fourth one here um it, uh, over porn or pornographic use by teens also creates distorted expectations which hinder healthy sexual development so that's the that's the fourth one we hit that we kind of already talked about that so yeah uh, yeah i mean it's i think that's i think that pretty much sums up what pornography is doing to teens um errol you want to touch more on like how it's impacting young adults and like maybe they're uh maybe the role it plays in like dating um i don't i don't really have too much stuff on like the roles like it, they're, they're definitely definitely probably is more like a uh societal pressures to like date now and um you know all that no, stuff. no i mean i mean how pornography would impact like people's um people's development their 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 ability to date like in the in the 21st century so you know so i, mean? I what think pornography is doing to that i i think it uh it it's a uh it's a uh it's a what's the word um it's a definitely non-self-serving there it's a self self-deprecating so yeah, right you have um 
if if you if you're like a teenager and then you have an idea of your in your head like of what like you want like out of a person like a like sexual wise or like in, in dating if like you just want to have sex because that is like what you're seeing um that is uh one like not like what you, you shouldn't be dating if that's the case one and two uh a lot of times uh those like sexual acts aren't depicting like a healthy like healthy intercourse um if no, you are it's like incent in um incestual now well there mm -hmm. yeah you have like the, the what are you doing step bro and stuff like that but no i'm just talking like the actual like act of intercourse like the um like uh it like penetrating like in all the way in and all the way out like um like that is not like uh it's it's not good like for like you it's it's not it's not good it could it could lead to like potential damage um i didn't know this until recently if you there's a potential i read this it was a scientific article don't ask me why i was looking it up um <laughs> you can pot, of course yes okay yeah we'll say that you could kill someone uh by uh if you if someone is upside down and you are having sex with them, there is a chance for a pocket of air to like go in through her, like go in through her cervix and then diffuse. And then it's like, you'll get a pocket of air and then you'll have a, like a, a heart palpitation. Yeah. I mean, like <laughs> to needless, needless to say, um, most sexual partners are not like having like fucking gymnastics level gymnastic level of, I mean, you know, maybe sometimes, but like, you know, the, the expectation that pornography, like, like, I mean, the expectation of pornography is very silly and it is fucking hilarious. By the way, I do want to mention, like, I'm not going to sit here and shit on pornography because pornography is hilarious in a lot of ways. Like it's, there's so much comedy in it and, um, I'm not well, it's of... almost like it's almost like uh, it's like the bastardization of theater. Like it's just yeah, like a... the, well, of sex too, right? Of sex yeah, too. like it's like it's, it's a um... silly version of sex. That's like right, exactly. It's um, what is it? It's uh, like all like the all the glitter and glam of like the it's like the idea of sex is what it literally is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like this idealization. The, I, I think both of us would, I don't know, would you, first of all, the arguments that have happened in Western civilization um, across the last like 30 or 40 years, I think they made a film about this, but um, the idea of like uh, involving the government in, I, I think in Europe, there was maybe even in the UK, they were considering like banning pornography legally, which is like, that's ridiculous like there's a place in the world for like pornographic expression and it's fine it's not like the the problem is 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 that there's now like so much accessibility to pornography that it's become like an addiction problem um yeah. it's it's destroying listen there's here's a here's a here's a smell test for you if you found if you find yourself staring at your screen without blinking for more than um more than like three or four minutes looking at something and your eyes hurt like there's your smell test. You you probably shouldn't be doing that, or you should be paying very close attention to how often you're doing it and start setting in some like um, putting in place some firewalls to prevent yourself from like being addicted. Because this is social media too, right? Like this is what people do. They they scroll feed. Right. Like, oh, but um, sorry, the uh, with the whole uh, yeah, with the whole like uh, pornography and uh, like setting expectations. So, like, I feel like uh, it's like uh, the, the the issue uh, you have is you um you have someone who is like watching pornography and then you know you are not doing anything to actually better yourself and like all you're doing is like getting this idea of what you want to do so you strike out with more girls and then you keep like you know you keep doing what you're doing but as you know just with anything chasing the dragon you get more and more perverse which leads into those paraphilias until like you know you can only uh someone's gonna someone's watching pornography and they get like um rejected so many times and start like presenting someone that's where they go into like you know the masochism and stuff right. and then if they if they are actually um like you know like resentful enough they're seeing something that can uh like kind of give them like a window or like an idea of it. like you know what i mean it just kind of uh what's the what's the word it just keeps uh it almost like fuels the fire to the point where yeah, like, you know, if, right. Yeah. To the point where like, if they 
are just like resentful enough they're like you know what i'm just going to do this act that i've seen like against someone's will like that's what i'm seeing like so yeah so like well i want to shift this a little bit forward um just because i want to i want to make sure we hit all of our uh all of our notes so one of the things i wanted to talk about a little bit that's kind of uh, somewhat it's actually a nice little bridge to that so like we're going to shift from that aspect or, or that time frame into like let's move into like uh older older folks and like how sexualization of culture might impact them. So like I actually just did a, I just did a, a, a an exercise like a, a written exercise in uh, my class about like marital statistics, right? So let's move into like that kind of aspect of like how it's impacting people who are married, such as myself. Um, and it's uh, so like there, it's actually I wonder, and, I, and I'm gonna just kind of lay out a couple of statistics, and I'll let you kind of uh, I'll let you cook on them, so to speak. Um, so like there's two things. Number one, divorce rates have been going up for a while. I actually think they've begun to go go back down, um, but they have been growing over the course of time and they've actually started to decline um, pretty recently. Which Yeah, I guess like um, uh, like millennials are uh, less. Big, divorced. Uh, right. Yeah. But good job. you got it. Well, yeah, sort of good job. But listen, I think there's a reason for that. And I'm going to follow that statistic up with something. And then I want you to marry you know, so to speak, marry these two uh, statistics and tell me what you think the role of sexual cultural sexualization has to do with it. So divorce rates are going down. It went up for a really long time, specifically in the seventies uh, post sexual revolution, but then they went back down as of probably the last 20 years or so, uh, which is good. But what also went down is marital rates generally, right? So less people getting married, in the 21st century as time elapses still to this day, I think every year, less and less people get married, um, which might actually be why I, I, I would imagine that that's adjusted. The divorce rate is adjusted to that, to those statistics. But um, regardless, I would, I would wonder what your perspective is on how a further or a, uh, a, a deeply sexualized culture affects um how that might have how you how would you think that that would affect the way the reasons that people don't get married as much now or if well, they so, do um you know how that might maybe not how that affects divorce rates but specifically how that's affecting the marital rate yeah so even like um one uh you know one lifetime ago a lot of the stuff that people are doing um was like taboo like um you did you uh you know, like, it, um, I would say like, a, I say one lifetime ago, but I'd say two, like two lifetimes ago, easily. Uh, you married one person um, and you did that at an early age. And then you had like seven kids. You had the, you know, your atomic family or whatever, um, or two and a half, sorry. Uh, and everything was just like cut and dry. Like you didn't, uh, you weren't as exposed to absolutely everyone as you could be you just had like the small community and um you almost see like uh i i guarantee there's a trend between like uh like just like cell phones and social media in general with that popularity with uh people not being as uh you know ready to settle for what's immediately in their vicinity like in a town or something just because you're able to, you know, literally talk to anyone across the world. Right. Yeah. And I think that, and that harkens back. So like, I wonder if like, so I was looking at some other statistics related to like infidelity in marriages um, that do exist. So like, um, so you have like, you have marriages that, so like of the people who are married in, within those marital rates that we were just talking about, like you have 20% of men and 13% of women have reported having sex with someone other than their spouse while married. Um, so performing infidelity or uh, adultery. Um, I wonder if that number goes up. Um, I wonder if that number has gone up or, or down. I, I don't have the statistics in front of me. I wish I did. I, I would uh, presume that, that it's gone up. I would bet my next paycheck it would, but like dating apps and just the accessibility of it now. Right. Like, so that's you know, what I that's what I was thinking is like, I wonder if like the, I wonder if the aspect of like, so those are reported within marriages, right? So like, mm -hmm. and probably they're used, it might not, the, the study doesn't say, but I wonder if it's used specifically like on legal terms, like, you know, uh, if someone's getting divorced, this has to be disclosed in a legal sense if there was an affair or if that was the cause of the, the, the divorce. Um, but whatever, I think it's mostly admission. Um, it might be, 
looks like it's mostly admission from what I can tell, but we'll, we'll presume that that's the case. You wonder that like people might be sh- <laughs> might genuinely just be shied away from marriages because of the concern. I wonder what the statistic it, it would uh, be. I wonder what the statistics would be or the percentages would look like if you could take a, if you could get an accurate polling data on how many um, people have been in a relationship that ended because of, uh, of uh, adultery or it's not technically legally adultery or infidelity because they're not married, but like just a regular relationship, a dating relationship that ended because of cheating. Um, and I wonder if like that number that I would assume that number has also gone way up. Um, and I wonder if that, if that has been exemplified in the culture enough that people are just not into the marriage idea. Um, I think the, the decrease in um, religious faith in most of the world has probably also contributed. Right. So like, you know, marriage. So that is, um, that's a good point because is it um, during, during it's like height, uh, everything, like all, all the stuff we're talking about here, like, uh, None of that happened with, like, you know, good Christian morals. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Fear God, the, the fear of God is... Yeah, bit, like, it was all, like, a, like um, infidelity and, like, you know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't of the church. It was, like, frowned upon. I'm not saying that that was, like, better because then I was, I'm also talking, like, uh, borderline, like, the, like, pre, um, like, the pre-feminist movement. But, like, it still just wasn't as... Uh, like prominent like so there was other issues there was some other stuff too but like you it was it's just the polar opposite of what it is now where they kind of flipped it on its ear and we're like oh we can make so much money off of this as opposed to like you save that for like a lot of the stuff now is like stuff you should save behind closed doors like you know it's just no one has any shame yeah and it's well it's also just a it's just an act of of um I think just marriage in general is just a um, well. There's like a, 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 a fear of commitment issue in like the millennial culture. I think too. Um, I think that probably com- you know that that strongly contributes. You got to imagine. Um, I mean, there's a lot of factors. The culture is just shifting in a lot of ways. Marriage is not so. What like the the um, the statistics we were looking at for this class surrounding marital statistics? It was like there's a, like a plethora of reasons why people are avoiding marriage. And one of them also is that like women are closing the wage gap. They're obviously, as is reported pretty frequently, um, you know, there's obviously a gender wage gap in the country that is, can be, well, we're not going to get into the details of that. Well, uh, yeah, I was going to say too, complex. like a bunch of. That's complex too, but like women are also much more self-sustaining now. So like there's a lot less, um, there's a lot less financial incentive for, you know, marriage than there probably was in the seventies, eighties, nineties. Right. right. I think um I think uh I think it's because everyone's broke. <laughs> Everybody nobody can afford. Well that that was a thing. No, 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 that's that's true. So do, can you guess like I this was a part of our statistical analysis. Um can you guess what the average cost for a wedding in the uh in twenty I think the statistics were twenty twenty one, but let's assume the same now. In twenty twenty three, how much do you think a wedding would cost? Man, it better not be on average, it better not be over like Man, and I—it's paining me to say this. Like, it better not be over like, uh, like six thousand bucks, bro. You're way off. Thirty-five thousand dollars. Why? That's, that's the average cost of a wedding in 2023, bro. Do you know how much my co- wedding costs? This is—I'm bragging about this. Like, you know, like we had some, like we, like we got away with robbery or something, but. Um, we had like a very, 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 you weren't even at my wedding. That's how, that, right. <laughs> that's how, that's how small my wedding was. Is that like, you're one of my best friends. You were not at my wedding. Um, we had just fam- just like a small group of family. It was like, we, I think we did it for like 1600 bucks, like just a little quick bang, but like $35,000. Can you fucking imagine spending $35,000 on your vanity? Like, I just, I'm not like opposed to it. Like I'm not opposed to like a, a nice wedding. I don't, I love attending nice weddings. They're fun, but like from my might just perspective, have a, might just have a cookout one time. That's a just lot be- of money, man. That's a lot of money. You could have one fucking hell of an extravaganza for $35,000. That's absurd. Dude, I might just, I might just have like the craziest cookout anyone's been to and then just be like, Hey, I'm eloped. 
<laughs> right. That's what I mean, though. But that's all, that's all you're there for anyway. You're just there to right. like be with family, and like that's right. all we did. Is like, you I mean, I think food. I think Ashley and I kind of feel. I think she would agree with this. I mean, she might. She probably give a little. I mean, she's just very. We'll say she's fiscally conservative. Uh, that's a way to. That's a way to <laughs> to talk about her and. A positive light but I, I would say that she'd still agree with me we, we definitely feel a little bad about not having some you know some of our closest friends there that day but um thirty five thousand dollars man that's a lot of money and you're yeah. right like i think i think you're right i think people just don't have that kind of money to get married so like i just i also think it's a commitment thing i think a lot of people just are just not there some people are in this world to just push against the the you know uh to push against the culture rather than to like ride the wave of it. Um, and I think that that's, that's just a, it's a pushback. It's like a revel, a, a social revolution against this institution of marriage. But like, I don't know for me, it's just like, um, I don't know. For me, it was more of a spiritual experience. Like I wanted to get married to the person I wanted to get married to. And like, that was a way to mark it and to like uh, uh, credential it and verify it to the world. But, right right not for everybody um anyway yeah so that's um i don't know let's let's circle back what like what do you think about um so do you think that um what was i gonna i had one more big one i wanted to hit but i'm kind of blanking on it now um oh here i wanted to cite a little bit of uh statistics from this this study um from business news daily here um so there are specific aspects of sexualization that don't work, according to this study. Um, sex is, quote, sex is not as effective when selling high-risk informational products such as banking services, appliances, and utility trucks. Um, marketing for such items is based on facts, testimonials, and customer service. Using sex to sell where it doesn't fit won't help move the product. Uh, the idea that sex doesn't always sell is supported by the results of an international journal of advertising study, which found that participants might remember sexy ads, but they don't necessarily recall what those ads were selling. So this kind of harkens back to what I was saying. Um, and this is from an article by Sandra Mardenfield, Mardenfeld, uh, contributing writer at the business news daily, uh, com website. Um, she's a writer over there. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's about right. Um, I thought, um, I thought GoDaddy was a porn site for like six years. It's like an. It's I still a, don't know. Isn't it a website? De- a yeah, it's like a domain. Thing. Yeah, it's like a. Yeah, thing. It's, it's a like a Wix dot com sort of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, th- that's just poor. Like I said, like I was saying to you before, like you have the, it's the sweet spot sell the product and i think the culture would be a lot better if marketing did this i'm sure that, like i said i'm sure they have a lot of like um data driven um decision makers who are like this is the this is the catalyst the the you know the catalyst for further sales and and for, you know higher levels of production when we drop advertisements like this or in this vein we produce more or we sell more um, mm-hmm. which I'm sure is a, you know, this in a capitalistic society, but I don't know at a certain point, I'd like to see corporations not be so, so capitalistically driven and a little They're, conscious of cultural impact instead of like always bottom line, which I know that that's, you know, I, I, whatever fiduciary duties you could call it, but I, like, who cares? Like if you can, you can do both, you can, you can profit for your shareholders and also be an honest, um, broker in the world of marketing as well yeah right you can uh be like be like a conscious uh do what's good for uh, society Company, and that, there that's are the thing to do that they, and that's the thing like that um the, these problems um are like a lot deeper for some things uh than they are others like you're saying like doesn't really work with like banking stuff or like appliances thank god I would. I don't know how I'd feel about like a sexy appliance commercial, bro. You could, there's so much comedy. There's just so much comedy there. <laughs> but um, take a look at this plunger. <laughs> but like in in other avenues, whether it's like fashion or um, especially like music, like you know, uh, like rap music and stuff, you'll have um, it, the the objectification of like black women in rap music oh is God, like it's, awesome. it's it's to the point where like um. You know, they're legitimately it, it's almost like a uh, like a callback like to like back in the day where like it was like a 
uh, people like they're like, oh, like a like the fifties. Yeah, with like jungle fever and stuff. Like this, all all the only thing a black woman's good for is just like twerking. You know it's what I mean? Even, oh my god! Well, it's not even just that. It's also like like um, rap music, like con- like genuinely calls. It, it, I understand it's an art form and it's an expression form. Like I, I I'm not stupid. I understand that, I and mean, I know that the argument there are arguments that you know that support its its freedom of expression, and like I get that. But like you and I both know that there are like aspects of rap of of rap music today that are being exercised in the real world by this by those artists. And like domestic violence against women is a part of that culture. That's a part of it's it's wrapped about it's wrapped about yeah d- domestic violence and like a like that's like a sexual violence too for sure for sure. Um, so so like mm-hmm. the deglamorization of that is like deeply important, and I think it's actually and, a responsibility for the artist. So that that's the thing too. Like when it's um when it's such a deep when it has such a deep cultural impact, and it's just like. You're seeing all the with like growing up with like advertisements, like you're seeing all these people who are like looked up to who are famous and uh, they just have people like, you know, dancing around them, like dress provocatively and stuff. You want to do that. And then like on one end, you're like the guy. So you're like, oh, I have to like have a bunch of people around me like dancing on me. And then if you're a girl, you're like, I guess I need to like the best thing I can do is like dance on some people and just like, you know, so it's um it makes it really hard if that is like the cultural norm, if you're trying to be above that, because like you'll be dragged, you'll be dragged through it by proxy. Like, even if you don't want anything to do with it, other people are still going to objectify you because it is what is unconscious. Right. It's like programmed into the culture to be like, um, and, and, I mean, that's not excuse making. That's just what it is. I mean, it, it right. is true. It's it is it, it, it's it's unconscious in a lot of ways. Um, but that's um, I saw I saw this or rather heard this uh, anecdote. Uh, the uh, this girl at her college, they did a um, what did they do? They did a uh, a like a social experiment where they had a like a white a white girl who was like a little bit like slimmer and. Uh, just like um you know not as curvy uh wear a skirt and then they had a black girl do it who's a little more curvy same exact skirt same length um the of course the uh the one girl who didn't necessarily have the curves was good to go but the uh, girl who was curvy uh got uh detention so they Mm -hmm. they got um they got removed from having an education because someone else sexually objectified them yeah that's like that's, that's a, superior, a superior saw that and he's like that or she that is you, you literally making, that's a literal objectification right that is that is i'm you, they see the skirt and they're like oh i'm thinking about like you know you in a sexual way so someone else might do that or even if you're just like someone might think of you in a sexual way like why are you entertaining that but uh <laughs> well have you, you know, ever they, seen uh, to to uh uh, I want. I, I don't mean to make light of that. That's actually pretty horrifying. But to make to kind of lighten it up a little bit. Have you ever seen that meme of like a teacher in a classroom and she's she's just wearing a pair of like you know uh, like suit pants or whatever, like just a, pair, a normal pair of dress pants, mm-hmm. but she's got like a she's got a rather large derriere, um, and she's like kind of like hunched over a, a a desk helping a student, and a student took a picture of it. And then, like the caption was, "Is this appropriate? Is it? Sh- is this appropriate, or should this woman, or should this teacher be fired?" And like the the meme is of a, a rare insult right beneath it. It just says, "What's she supposed to do? Leave that ass at home?" <laughs> <laughs> Which is like she just just comes in and like a that's but that it harkens exactly to what you're saying though. It's just like you're just objective. Like she's not she's wearing the same clothes. It's the same right. literally the same clothes. She just she has um, she has the shape of her body is the shape of her body and that that mm-hmm. goes for everyone nobody can control that yeah oh so um with the uh i i'm going to keep harkening back to that uh to the uh to the swimmer's body illusion when yeah. it comes to both like men and women uh so like with women with like you know body proportions whether it's like breast size like waist size or uh men when it comes to like uh shoulder size um like you know like 
uh, height is, I guess, is a huge thing, and I uh, not balding too. Um, apparently, is something where, like, you know, as a as a game changer. But uh, having a six pack, um, having a perfect middle like carved six pack, um, is uh, is pre predetermined. I'm not saying like uh, if you get to a certain like body fat percentage, like you will. Some people have six packs, and some people don't, or it's like unobtainable. But what I mean is, um, due to your body fascia. Uh, it is your six packs already predetermined. It looks a certain way. Some people have like a sculpted looking six pack that is like symmetrical perfectly like down to, and other people like you've seen it. They're just like a little bit off. That's not due to like how they trained or anything. That is your uh, fascial bands in your abdomen. It's I, believe, I believe this. I believe this because I've, I've tested this hypothesis. Can't be done. Can't be done. Yeah. Can't, can't acquire a six pack. It's no. So awesome. you, you have a, you have a six pack. Oh, and I, if you, and if you go down to like a if you it's calories in calories out um but it if it looks like it's not like a perfect six pack it's not going to be due to like anything you've done in your life like any kind of training it's your how your six pack already looks how it looks like you can't uh this yeah, it's just, it's just being exposed by lack it, of body so fat. like it's a the difference between like oh if you i have like six a six pack but if i work on my obliques i'll have like an eight pack and then if i work harder i'll have a 12 oh yeah no, no yeah you, those exist yeah, you're, because they exist you're you're right. born with like you know you could have a four pack like you know you could just have it's just about how much body how much actual like fat tissue is sitting on top of the organ of the abdominal organs like and and how much of that you can burn off to actually expose them is that part's up to you. But what the actual abdominal abdominal muscles look like, that's that's predetermined. No, I'm with you on that. That makes perfect sense. I've that, that I haven't seen my six pack in many years, but like I'll I'll say that it I'll, I can verify that it exists in every human. But like it takes a for some reason that is a spot and that is a like a part of the human body that's like very very difficult to tone because core is fucking hard, man. Nobody wants to work their core. Shit sucks. Hurts. Um, that aside, though. Um, yeah, no. Um, before we uh, wrap up, Errol, let's. Uh, is there anything like more uh, pressing that you wanted to hit before we before we wrap up and uh, kind of uh, introduce the next pod that we're gonna do and close this out? Anything big you want to hit or talk about before we go? Oh, did I lose you? I think I lost you for a second. You, you back? You did. Yeah, I'm back though. Okay. Um, what? Well, where, where did I cut off? No, I was just asking you. Actually, it's a kind of a perfect spot for you to ch- for you to um, cut out there because uh, I was just checking to see. I wanted to ask you if you had anything big you wanted to talk about. Any last final like segment you want to dive into for a few more minutes, or are you uh, are we pretty well covered on the topic of cultural sexualization? Yeah, no, I did. I just, I had like, I was actually just doing like borderline like a closing statement before I was so rudely interrupted by the internet. Ah, well, that um, internet. I, I was saying like uh, the main takeaway from this for like everyone is, is um, I don't think it's healthy, nor I don't, I, I also think you shouldn't uh, compare yourself to a uh, like a media conglomerate or like any kind of like a uh, media interpretation because uh, it is like designed and uh it's designed and it's literally like down to a science to uh like show a rose colored like you are seeing like the best version of something so i'm not saying like it's unattainable or you shouldn't like try to better yourself but um there's i don't think you should compare yourself to like you know uh, what what you see i think you should just yeah. try to be the best you yeah beauty beauty is not skin deep it's right it's, um you know i have two daughters so i think i have two very young daughters and i think about this a lot because of where you know the world's at and especially on this issue um and for them i always think about like um focus on being a beautiful person within and the rest will take care of itself yeah um, don't uh don't don't be uh don't be fooled by a bud light commercial like you know you can well, you as can. far as that goes, it's almost like the. I guess my clo- if I'm going to throw a closing statement, so to speak, at the at the topic, it's like number one, I think people need to delay gratification more. Like, and that goes for social media. That goes for um, people in con- in conglomeration with social media. I think a lot of people they they try to ensure that they're living a life that they can 
exposed to the they want their life to feel like a movie because it kind of is because of social media because the world is the world of you know the world that they want to see it they're going to let them see it and they're going to record it and so people make decisions about what they're going to do and what life they're going to live and how great it's going to be and how great it's going to look and it's all based on how they want other people to perceive it and um let's just say that that like if you delay gratification the gratification part of that is like <laughs> restraint man like restraint is is a beautiful tool it's it's such a useful tool and um there's nothing wrong with having a twitter account having an instagram having having social media platforms you know i personally i don't i don't know what good they're really doing for the world i mean there's some it's minimal but um i think restrained use and 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 being conservative with your use of social media is probably a great idea for most people i I think most people would benefit deeply from that um i just think it's a you know delaying the gratification that you get from social acceptance is is pretty important um and i like i said i have as as a father of two young young girls i worry about this stuff a lot and um i worry about where where things are going to go and how how people are just so um deeply interested and focused on their appearance and things that are just vain in a lot of ways and i i hope that um i hope the culture can there's like an anti-intellectual movement in the culture in a lot of ways and um i hope that changes i hope that really changes where we start valuing we've more more so value people who have ideas and who have new ways of articulating themselves and um, perceiving the world and, and describing the world around them. I think that's more of, that's, that's what people should focus more on instead of, you know, how they look in, um, you know, being advertised to, because by the way, we didn't even touch this, but just as a side note, like the social media business model is built upon advertisement. <laughs> it's so funny because it is in and itself an advertise, like you're advertising yourself, amongst like, advertisements. Yeah, well, so here's, Instagram here's the is thing. an advertisement of your life. Anything you don't pay for, um, you are, if you're not paying for something and you're using it, it's because you are the product. Um, yeah. Other companies are using whatever site you're using so they can put their ads on it and then you will look at it. And that, that is the job of social media is just to generate ad revenue. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the goal. And that's what the, that's, they're working in tandem, right? That's, that's just what's happening. It's a, it's a, it's not always malicious. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to insinuate that like all these corporations have this like grand evil plan. I am. <laughs> well, I mean, you could make the argument and it, they do have an ethical duty to address the problem of mental health, that the mental health deterioration of specifically young girls that they're causing. I mean, we didn't even talk about suicide rates and we could pull those pretty quickly and, 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 and terrify everyone with them. But like suicide rates are very, very high and they're specifically high in teenage girls. Um, over the last yeah. Time. Especially like uh, uh, even more. So I, I guarantee the attempts are like, uh, like off the charts. Um, right. The statistic is that girls attempt suicide more than boys, but boys achieve suicide more. Well, I, I think it's That's like um, I think it's male, female. And the the reason for that is uh, a lot of times uh, whatever whenever a guy will do something, it tends to be um, a lot more like, like for lack of a better word, like permanent, like a uh, means like a uh, more more men shoot themselves. And, then yeah, women girls, shoot themselves. Girls swallow pills, right? Which is something. Prescription you, overdose is really high in if, girls, and then uh, firearm suicide is. This is exactly right. This is. If I've I statistic somewhere before, yeah. It's about right. If I if I walked in the room right now and like it was a horrible example, but uh, if I walked in my roommate's room right now and he like overdosed on pills, I'd be able to get him help. But like if I walked in and he like shot himself in the face, like it's like you can't really. Yeah, that's a you that's know a, not much, not much to do. Yeah, on that horrifying note, um, <laughs> no, I, I, I want to say another horrifying thing. Real quick. <laughs> so um, we, this is our darkest pod yet, um, but it, it does have an optimistic spin. So, um, but go ahead, go ahead before. Yeah. Um. So with all this hyper sexualization and these like ideals of um, you know, uh, sexuality, like kind of like cranked up to a thousand um it, it like, i think we touched on it like it does put people at risk 
Um, so uh, worldwide, around 15 million adolescent girls aged 15 to 19 have experienced uh, forced sex in their lifetime. Here is, so that is horrifying. Like that is an awful statistic. Here is the scariest thing I've probably read this year. Like legitimately, like I was, I was, I, I, I was a, 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 a guest. It was, a, it was, it's awful. Um, based on data from thirty countries, only one percent of adolescent girls who have experienced forced sex reach out for professional help. Good lord, one percent. That's just awful. out of uh, fear of. Uh, the repercussions social persecution oh exactly all that that's why there's oh. been the um you could you could almost call it the uh, i believe it's be, almost being referred to as like the fourth movement of feminism in like the me too movement yeah. or sorry the fourth wave yeah that's 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 i mean that's terrifying that's yeah, a terrifying no, that's... statistic especially like um i don't know that's that's just that you're right. That is. I didn't. Uh, so I read one of the darkest statistics I've heard in a long time. It's I did. I didn't like. I didn't believe what I was reading. I read it on UNICEF. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So what's the solution to that? I mean, the solution to that is podcasts like this. I mean, I hope. I hope that we've done a halfway decent job of at least shedding a little light on some on some on some things. Um. You know. Um. I. You know. I. <laughs> I um, think there's... it's, it's going to th- listen. I will say this just in terms of the podcast. I would really like to revisit this topic or something tan, uh, uh, something uh, kitty corner to this topic um, and kind of stay in this ballpark again, which I definitely think we'll do. Um, but... um, there is stuff that you can um, that you can do in the meantime. If, um, if there's a couple uh change makers and uh, organizations that are um, in a fight to end uh, the objectification if not like the overall objectification of girls in media oh, um, at the very least tone it down because I will, if you know, I I'd be a liar. If I said like, I wasn't a sucker for those James Bond movies. I was like, you know, just abhorrently detesting a couple hours ago, but like there's, you know, there's time and place for everything. And it's not like, you know, well, listen, you can, it, you can, you can consume media that it objectifies women. Um, just, just be aware of it. That's all. I mean, that's all it's about. It's a, it's not a. Listen, if I've always said this, and this goes, this goes, harkening back to the Me Too movement. Like there are artists who have said and done some horrible things. Like, I mean, there there are lines. Obviously, I ain't watching the Cosby Show anymore. I can't really, I can't do that one. That's one that, like, okay, I just can't see you any other way. I'm sorry, man. Like you're done. You're done for me. And that's okay. But there are like there are other artists that like. Like, bro, Rosemary's Baby is a great film, but Roman Polanski is one of the worst people in Hollywood ever. Like, he's right. an absolute monster. And, like, I don't – just because I watch Rosemary's Baby doesn't mean I support him. I just I, – I think the art the art of the film is good. And I think that The Pianist is an amazing film. And uh, I think Annie Hall – Well, so, so here, here's is, the separating thing. Separating the artist from the art is, like – Well, so <laughs> here's the thing, too. Like, it, as, a, as um, abhorrent as uh, Roman Polanski uh, was – um, he didn't make that whole thing with his blood, sweat, and tears. It is, uh, I don't think it's wrong to separate the art from the artist because it wasn't just the artist. It was a whole film crew. It was the yes. actors. Right. It was, it wasn't just the man behind the film, but, um, it's uh, like you said, the only thing you can really do or the best thing you can do is just be aware of it. And, right, be, like, be, know, just, just be informed. Well, of, so it, it's also like at, at some point though, you kind of don't want to like support it. Like it, it's not like you, it, but it's, it's not support. It's like it, the art does listen. If, have you ever seen the pianist? The pianist is like one of the most, like it's a very, very dark film, but it's a deeply inspiring film. Like it's about, uh, uh, Vladisla Spielman, who was a, uh, a, a concert pianist, a, a Polish German, a Polish, uh, Jewish, a concert pianist who like survived the Holocaust by through his like ability to play. Like he had Nazi soldiers, SS soldiers, like asking him to play for them because he played so he played the piano so beautifully and it actually like saved his life. And like there's it, the film is is beautiful. It's a beautiful mm-hmm. tale of a Polish Jew um, who just never gave up hope and like almost died many times. And it's a very dark and awful film, but at the same time it's a very like beautiful film. 
that film was directed by Roman Polanski and it's like very personal film for him. And like, I'm sorry, but like watching that film is not a, it's not me supporting Roman Polanski from watching the film is me. It's it's I'm being in touch with the story. And no, like, I'm saying like conveying um, it, but he's not conveying it in the sexually assaultive way that he conducted himself in his personal life. No, I'm just but saying like, like if you um are going out of your way to like actively like oh he made a new movie let me like you know make yeah, sure the theater and make sure he gets the right, right. Like, exactly. I mean that's a little different, but even even still like he's never making it alone, and like not everyone who works with him is like an evil monster either. Like. I mean, personally, I think he should be in prison. Um, I mean, I think that most people probably agree with that. He should be in prison and so should Woody Allen by the sounds of it. Um, but those guys are both continuing to make movies and he he's getting people to work with him. Dude, I mean, I'll say this. I'll say this publicly, which will probably like if this ever gets like um, if this ever gets like broadcast to a wider audience. I mean, I know a lot of people do know about this, but like we talked about in our old podcast, a director by the name of Victor Salva. Um, he made, he made like the first Jeepers Creepers movie. And I think he made the second one too. And, uh, a couple of movies in the, um, in the nineties and eighties and on a film set, um, a film called clown house back in the eighties, he like, uh, he like raped one of the children, uh, one of the boys in one of the actor boys, like the main actor, uh, child in the film on the set. Right. Jesus. And went to prison. No, no, here's the stuff. We talked about this. We talked about this with Kevin, with uh, Kevin Murray and Jared yeah. and, or, or Sean um, and, uh, and Bigsby on the old podcast. We talked about this. Mm-hmm. A bit. I'll talk yeah, about it's, it. Here it's ringing some bells. Because I've actually, there's an update to the story that I learned about, um, you know, and it, just because we're on the topic of like separating art from artists, um, you know, and this is a weird way <laughs> to end the podcast, but I'll just say it anyway because I don't really care. Um, Victor Salva went to prison, he directed the film, raped the child, and then he went to prison for this and well, didn't go to prison for long enough, in my opinion. He was only in prison for a handful of years, probably should have spent the rest of his life there for raping a child, um, but got out, then um, got financed to continue making films, right, and working with children. Uh, oh, I believe geez. I'm sure I'm sure there's children in some of his films. I, mean, I doubt that like I very much doubt that he just went on making films and there were no I mean, I don't know. I can't I'd have to look at his filmography. But here's here's the kicker, though. This is the thing that like people don't know about. And it's a little bit of a horror show or, you know, it, don't meet your fucking heroes, man. That's all I can say to you. Um, do you want to know who helped fund him and publicly supported him by saying, quote, um, the age gap between him and the child was was not that drastic. And, and by the way, I should say the age gap of the child he raped was like 20 years or something like that. Well, not that drastic. Not that drastic. It was like 18 years. I don't even money, money, who even cares. It was statutory rape. If even if it was consensual, it right? Can't yeah, be. it was a child. Even right. if that was the case, but worse, it wasn't because he was a child. And he definitely it was he was charged with the rape of this child, right? Mm-hmm. This guy's a monster. This guy's a true monster. You know who said that? Who? Hmm. And and then supported this director's career and then financially supported him. I can't even guess. Francis Ford Coppola. Oh shit! Yeah, don't meet your heroes, man. Don't like. Terr- terrifying to hear that that icon, that like beacon of film ma- of filmmaking, like lore and just the the brilliance of that man and like what he contributed to the to the world of cinema i know i know i mentioned in this podcast that i thought i was distantly related to him which i don't i don't even know if that i don't think that's true and i'm gonna distance yeah of course yeah of course you say it now i I did some research and it's looking like ties with the old family back east um (laughs) No, I, I, I don't. I genuinely. Well, I was always, I was always speculating about that. It was just something that came up in like my dad's like DNA genetic testing thing. But, um, but no, I mean, you, this is what I'm. This is what we're saying though. Is like, there. I mean, we haven't even skimmed the surface of like. So the culture is sexualized, but the sexualization of Hollywood is a deep. That's a, it's a pretty horrific, you know, rabbit hole you don't want to go down. But like, um, you know. We're talking about guys like Roman Polanski and like, you know, being able to consume you, you feel free to go watch The Godfather, despite the fact that you just if you heard what I just heard about Francis Ford Coppola, basically, you know, um, 
basically scoffing off uh, the rape of a child be- just right. because he saw, you know, he supported a filmmaker. Maybe. I don't know why, what his incentive it. was for being quoted as saying that, but like, I mean, it's, it's all you got to do is Google search it. It's not, I mean, I'm not saying that that's what he said. I didn't hear him say that, and I'm not guaranteeing anything that that's 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 what he said. But I'm just, I'm insinuating that it, it it's been it's been cited. It seems as though that that was his position on it. I think there's probably enough evidence that he definitely supported Victor Salva, and um, I think it's a horrifying aspect of a, a otherwise great career. But like once again, watch The Godfather. Watch The Godfather Part Two. It's 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 not a you know, you don't have to attach morality to every, you know, consumer decision you make. It's just about being aware, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and on that note, um, well, I'll actually, I was going to cite this too. 1-800-656-467-73. That is the National Sexual Assault Hotline, open 24 hours. Um, you could also visit the National Sexual Assault Hotline confidential 24-7 support website. Um, that's a good spot. Um, but these are... There's a crisis text line. There's a lot of crisis support out there for people who, specifically for young women who might experience sexual abuse or sexual assault. Um, you know, go to the authorities. And I know it's. I can't imagine. I'm speaking. We from the we gotta get that one percent up. We got like um, right. Yeah, yeah we, it's a horrifying. That's, that's um. I didn't like. I'm saying like I'm saying. I didn't even know about that until I did research about this. Um, that that's got to change. Yeah, and I don't mean to like insinuate that, like, because I'm a I'm a male, I'm a, I'm a I'm a male walking around in the world without this worry. Um, typically, you know, for, for about 99 99 percent of men don't worry about the same things women do, and I know that if this happens to them, it's probably fifty thousand times harder to come forward um, than you and I can even imagine it to be. Well, no, th- that's the, that's the thing. There's so many like issues like uh, that, that go into that. It's not as easy as just like reaching out, especially if you are in a situation of uh, d- domestic abuse. Um, mm-hmm. Abusers are really good at, uh, you know, isolating people, but that is, that's what, when I'm saying that those numbers need to go up, there needs to be more resources. Something's got to change. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good, that's a good place to, to uh, that's a good place to stop. I, Cause I think that's right. I think that's a good, that's a, that's exactly the the message I would, I would like to leave the podcast on. And um, it also starts with us. It starts with consumers. Like, like we said, you can consume things, you can consume things that don't objectify women. Um, yep. I'm not trying to like, you know, this is a free country and, and there's a lot of beautiful art out there that is exploitive and manipulative, but it's still good art and there's less life lessons to be learned within it. Um, but for sure, just be just be more aware and um, big corporate America. I'd really like to see a damp down on the fucking constant sexual objectification of women. That would be cool. Um, um, there are there are a couple organizations. Um, if you do feel some kind of way about this, uh, that are trying to combat uh, the overall, uh, at least to tone down the overall. Um, I think tone down is a good word because I yeah. listen. I don't want like boobs to go. Pure, away. I don't want to pierce <laughs> you know in America I mean? either. Like I, really I am. Don't. You're a man. I'm a man, and like th- we do, still like these things. It's just it's it's that's why I think the title of the podcast belongs as the hyper sexualization of culture, especially Western culture, because it is um it's gotten to a place where the effects are just so are so negative that like, I mean, listen, man, like some there are women in the world who actually do want to sexually express themselves in a public way or in a marketing way. And that's, that's fine. It just doesn't need to be like crammed down everyone's throat and like so obsessed over. Right. Right. Um, there, there are a couple organizations trying to uh, combat that. Um, we'll, I'll, I'll give you the links for those so we can put them up. Yeah. I'll um, post them with the episode for sure. Yep. Uh, first one's going to be the, uh, the Gina Davis Institute on gender and media. Um, they, uh, they work within media and entertainment or in the entertainment industry to engage, educate, and influence media producers to dramatically improve gender representation in films, to stop stereotyping girls and women and create diverse female characters in in entertainment targeting children ages 11 and under. Um, another one is going to be the, uh, for every girl campaign and, uh, they're calling on entertainment and me- or in the media industry uh, leaders to uh, create an environment where young girls feel valued and are uh, defined by uh, healthy media images of themselves. Uh, we'll leave a petition for that, uh, you know, call on leaders in entertainment, uh, 
or the petitions to call on leaders in entertainment and uh, media industries to produce media images that respect, empower, promote uh, the true value of every girl. Like we we're saying before, it's is more than skin deep. It always has been. Right. And then uh, the last one, which is uh, very important um, on the note that you were hitting, uh, Together for Girls uh, is a, a global public-private partner, <laughs> is a global <laughs> public-private partnership dedicated to ending violence against children with a focus on sexual violence against girls. Uh, UNICEF, the World Health Organization, and other partners collaborate with national governments and uh, civil uh, society and uh, share their uh, expertise and resources to address this egregious human rights violation and public health concern. Perfect. Yeah, so those are great. All those links are going to be, um, they'll either be on our Twitter page. Um, they'll definitely be on the Twitter page, we'll say. Um, so, and I'll try to include them in the link to this this episode so that way they're all in one place. Um, and we'll actually pin that to the top of the Twitter page. So uh, that'll be up and um, available to anybody interested in the podcast who, who you know, wants to reach out and let's let's publicize a, a little bit of this stuff. And, and like I said, raise a little bit of public awareness about um, about these things and instead of, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to say boycotts don't work like boycotts. You don't need to boycott things you don't like. It's just just be a, a conscious consumer in the world. I think that's a better place to be, especially in a place that's so focused on capitalistic uh, endeavors. Um, being a conscious consumer can can do uh, can do wonders to combat some of this uh, some of the uh, cultural outcomes of a sexualized media. So, um, on that note, Errol, what do you think? Should we uh, should we wrap this up? Um, if and if we're going to, uh, well, let me ask you: Do you have anything else you want to add? Because I, I want to do I do want to talk about what, what's coming up next. Yeah, no, I'm um, uh, like you're saying earlier. We'll we'll likely touch back on this. For sure. At, a, at some time. Yep. So uh, we'll call this part one of the uh, cultural sexualization uh, project um, over here at the Peripheral Views podcast. What we've got coming next, a uh, little bit lighter note, <laughs> we're going to shift back and we're going to have a little more fun in the next pod. Not that this wasn't enjoyable. We, it's important stuff to talk about, but it is definitely on the darker side of, of our content. So um, we're going to shift back. Um we are talking. We're gonna we're gonna do the uh, <clears throat> another ranking show uh, is coming up next in the podcast. Um, this will be our th- uh, second, right? This is our second ranking show. I believe it's our second. It's either our second or our third ranking show. Um, either way, um, it's a two parter. Um, we are going to be talking. Uh, Errol and I are going to rank. It's October. It's getting close to Halloween. We want to talk a little bit about horror films, about horror in general. Um, so we are going to do a top 10 horror films of all time, um, for Errol and I, we're going to do that as part of the ranking show. That'll be the second part of the ranking show. The first part, um, is actually, I've got a little bit of a, not a, I'll, I'll drop the surprise. Now the first part of the ranking show, Errol and I are both going to discuss the top five Stephen King film adaptations. We're going to rank those in order, but here's the twist. We do have, uh, hopefully, he was going to join us on the Lighthouse episode. He could not make it for that uh, pod, so we went on without him. But uh, fortunately, I think he's going to join Errol and I. Steve Launderville is jumping on with us, a buddy of ours. He's uh, he's going to do a ranking of the top five Stephen King film adaptations. We're going to talk about that for a little over an hour in the first part of the pod. Then uh, he's going to drop off the pod, and Errol and I are going to jump into our top ten horror films of all time for the ranking show. That's coming up next week, so keep your eyes peeled for that. That'll be out next Monday. Um, so that's it. Errol, have you got anything you want to add? Um, any uh, comment on the uh, the the return of Steve Launderville to uh, Jake and Errol podcast? What do you think? Oh, did I lose you again? Oh, no. No, no, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I was I, just uh, muted. I uh, caught you muted. No, what do you yeah, think? Yeah. Steve Launderville returning to a uh, podcast with us. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, wicked excited for it. I miss him. Yeah, no, he's great. He's great. He's got a lot. He, he listen. If anybody's if anybody's got something to say, it's old Steve Onderville. He's going to contribute greatly to uh, that pod. So we're looking looking really forward to that. Um, this pod is going to be out Monday. Uh, it's actually Monday now, so it'll be out. Uh, it'll be out in the morning. Um, check this one. Um, hope hope you guys enjoyed the, the the talk. I know it's 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 not an easy topic of conversation. I hope we were somewhat informative and. Um, I hope our perspectives were uh, helpful um, in some 
some capacity in the contribution of dialogue to the, to the topic. Uh, we really look forward to seeing you to uh, doing next week's podcast, getting back into some more fun stuff. Not so not super serious stuff uh, like today's pod, but um, we will definitely be circling back to it at a later date as well. So um, like I said, ranking show number two coming next week. And for that, that is it for us um, on the peripheral views podcast. Thanks again for joining us. Um, check us out on Twitter at peripheral V one, two, three, uh, we're on SoundCloud, soundcloud.com forward slash peripheral views one, two, three, uh, peripheral views podcast.com. That's where the, that's the website. Hit us at peripheral views podcast at gmail.com for any feedback. Thanks again for joining us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate the uh, listenership and the support. We'll see you on the next round of the peripheral views podcast. <laughs>